So I'm here with David Lagoric, and let me say, you're coming up on your 31st birthday. Oh, gosh. Uh, but your life and your career experience suggest that you're actually like 60 years old. You've been through so much. Yeah, I mean, thanks for reminding me that I will be 31. And it's a very uneventful birthday, I'm assuming. Um, but, I, you know, it's funny you say that because I still feel like, you know, I still feel like a 15-year-old. I'm still kind of a child, um, sort of grown man's body. Um, and that's what I think, I, I, that's why I kind of enjoy uh, what I do um, and the experiences I've had. I don't know, I, it's nothing new to me because I've grown up kind of living in different countries and just trying to explore and, um, you know, experience different new exciting things. Being a professional soccer player, uh, it's always been a dream of yours. Do you remember your very first soccer memory? Yeah, so probably I was about three years old. Um, it was the first time I was able to play soccer, and it was funny because they, my, my mom tells me the story that they didn't allow anyone three years old on this team. It was a four, four years old and up, and somehow she talked her, talked her way on to letting me, you know, play. Um, so I was just a little scrub playing, and you know, I remember seeing photos of it, and um, from there I just never stopped playing. Um, all of my family played. I had four older brothers. We all. We all played soccer, and um, it kind of just became a household, um, you know, sport. So, 15, you start taking it even more seriously. You start getting out there. How, when was the first moment you realized, hey, I can actually make a go of this? So, I had this dream when I was younger that I really wanted to uh, play professional in Europe. I used to watch, uh, you know, VHS tapes. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I, just, I just saw the atmosphere. I saw the stadiums. I saw what it was like. And so I had told myself very young that that was my goal. I mean, I had no idea how I was going to get there, um, but I just I put that in my head. So the first real experience I had was, was around 13. Uh, my mentor, Mark Dillon, who had played in Europe and, and had connections, uh, arranged for a trial in Germany at uh, Bayer Leverkusen, which is a very respected academy, a very big professional team. So I took this opportunity and again, knew nothing about, you know, the European football and the level. And I was there at the academy playing under the pro team and there was big name players. But in America, we didn't know who these guys were. So that was a great experience and it kind of um, gave me that fire inside that kind of stuck with me years later that, you know, when it was, it was tough in America and I was, you know, playing or not playing, I remembered the goal, which was to play there in Germany, to play in that stadium. Um, and, and that kept me going for a long time. Now, speaking of big-name players, you've been coached by some amazing people. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Dom. What was it like to, to have him want to teach you the ways? Christoph Dom, yeah. Um, so I was really young. That was, I think, 14 or 15. Um, and I had gone over with a, with a buddy of mine. We both tried out at uh, Austria Vienna. And we didn't know who this guy Christoph Dom was, but we had been called into his office. Uh, very intense, very, um, you know, had an amazing career, this guy. Um, but just the nicest, sweetest, you know, man. And, and he taught us a lot. He spoke to us. He was very friendly when we were there. Um, but on the field, an absolute shark uh, when he was coaching. So I loved that. I mean, he, he kept the standards very high. Um, but at the same time, off the field, absolute gentleman. Did you know right from day one that you wanted to be a goaltender? Or how did you get to that point? No. <laughs> I still, still don't even really know if I wanted to be a goalie. Um, I played striker up until, you know, eight, nine, and then somehow I had a giant growth spurt. And so they said, hey, you're, you know, you're tall, jumping goal. Um, and I said, well, do I have to run a lot? They said, no, you just stand there. I said, awesome. It's a great job. They said, you can yell at people too. I said, beautiful. Don't tell me anymore. So just kept playing goalie from there. I had a knack for it, um, I think, because I was slightly mental. I didn't care about, you know, getting kicked in the face or diving at people's feet. Um, you know, and I really enjoyed kind of being that last man. So once I got that taste for being able to win or lose the game, um, that kind of passion, that uh, drive is, is, is quite an exciting feeling. Being that last man, seeing your whole team in front of you, What's it like to go from contract to contract, team to team, having to change not necessarily the way you play, but the way you view your teammates? 
Yeah, that's that's kind of the the down down parts of uh, professional life is you, you know, you get to know thirty amazing you know teammates in a year, and you become best friends. You're almost family, and then you know the coach either makes changes and trades players, or you have to change teams. You know, sometimes change countries, and so keeping in touch, keeping that you know bond and that um, is, is difficult. You know, but then again, you get thirty more. So I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day. It's 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 how quickly in professional life you can go from knowing 30 to a thousand players, um, and your your football network becomes huge. And so again, I keep in touch with a lot of my professional buddies. I call them throughout the year just to just to catch up, bug them, bounce ideas off them. Um, you know, and I think in that way we have a great uh, you know union of, of players. And you've played for numerous teams, as I said. Um, it's not always up to the coach and the contract. You actually declined a contract after your second season with Sweden. What made you make that decision? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors uh, when it comes to, you know, contracts and getting on teams. You know, for example, last year I had a, you know, had a two-year contract and, and based on the season went, um, you know, we, we parted ways. And so, basically, I've always taken my life, uh, you know, a month at a time, two months at a time, and that's just the way I set my goals. I have a six-month, you know, five-year plan but you know how it is things can change very rapidly and you just have to be able to adapt and that's I think being one of my biggest skills um, and it has made me somewhat successful in my career was being able to adapt to any situation you know good or bad um, I found a way to if things weren't working out you know find another way find a solution um, and just figure it out before it gets out of hand. Taking that solution uh, you apply it to fears as well um, I know that you grew up with vertigo. I've had vertigo, it's not fun. Yes. Um, but it made you afraid of heights. Yes. But you, you overcame that. What gives you that push, that little bit of crazy to, to take it to the next level and to conquer that fear? When it comes to fear, like, I challenge myself when things, when things aren't easy. I don't know, it bugs me. Um, and when things are when things are difficult, it's a challenge for me. So I I enjoy kind of like I'm a bit stubborn. So if someone says, "Hey, you can't do that," I'm generally going to say, "Nah, you know, screw you. I'm going to try it out." So it's the same thing with fears. It's the same thing with personal uh, insecurities. I like to kind of figure out a way to to tackle them because I don't like to feel vulnerable like anyone else. I don't like to feel like I can't do something. Um, and there's always a solution I found to, to kind of anything. So when it comes to vertigo, I ended up paragliding off of a mountain um, in Nepal from 2,000 feet, you know, f just free paragliding. And in that moment, I kind of overcame the vertigo and really enjoyed kind of just being in the moment. And I, it's, it's an amazing rush. I had the chance to do it in South Africa, and you yeah. can't. You can't explain it. It's just, it's like you're flying and for that moment, you're untouchable. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I have to ask, did you ever end up going skydiving as well? I haven't. I've been wanting to. There's, I have this goal of skydiving as well as, as wingsuit diving, which is a crazy goal yeah. as well. But I figured if you're going to go for it, you know, go big. Um, but no, I've done that, bungee jumping, jumping off of fun cliffs. Anything that's kind of challenging and, and it, gets, it gets the adrenaline going, right? You know, especially when you get up to that edge or whatever it is, you have those uh, inside voices that will tell you a lot of different things. It'll say, stop, quit, go home, you're whatever. Even physically, sometimes you'll have the legs shaking. But it's fun if you can get past that little barrier. Um, then there's kind of that moment of calm, right, that you overcame that. And then you can really enjoy any moment. And that brings us back to soccer, overcoming things. Uh, being that goaltender... You know, when a team wins or a team loses, a lot of it rests on the goaltender. Uh, if you let in that one goal, it's all your fault. Yeah. If you made that one save that crushed the other team, that stopped them from pursuing the win, you're the man of the match. How do you deal with those emotions? Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's something I've developed over years of trial and error. Um, of, and it's a combination of, you know, self-reflection and, and what I call mindfulness. So basically, again, there's going to be so many voices when it comes to everybody, life and sport, to tell you, hey, you didn't do good. Hey, you don't look good. Hey, this, you don't fit in. 
Whereas I always tried to look inwards to, you know, really what am I doing? Am I doing the right things? You know, for example, in a game, was it a mistake that I am commonly making or was it a one-time error, right? When I broke it down like that, a lot of times, you know, it's a lot easier to digest if it's a one-time error, right? Whereas it's very easy to go, oh, this is a huge issue. This is a huge problem he's having. And then that's when you're creating, creating problems that are not there. So, I, you know, I try to teach goalkeepers and, and athletes to just become more mindful. So self-analysis, self look at video, look at, you know, get feedback from, um, you know, coaches and, and start to really look at your own skills, you know, because it's amazing how many skills are within you with that you don't really ever tap into because someone says you couldn't do it. And I read that your, your first career mistake was actually one of those points where you wondered if that was it for you um, or if you could push past it. Obviously, you pushed past it. You've made a career for yourself. Uh, but is that something that you share with the, the people that you're coaching? That one, you know, it's, it's, I can talk about it now because it's been, what, 12 years? Or, um, but that was, you know, that was dark moments, right? That was a huge, pivotal moment in my career that it was the first game I had played in Thailand. You know, I'd been doing. I'd been there six months with the bat, as the backup of the Thailand goalkeeper in the national team, and so just waiting for my shot. I get my shot. I do well. Suddenly, I make a huge mistake in front of thirty thousand people. So a little change of scenery. Yeah. Uh, we got kicked out of where we were, which is aggressively fine. Kicked out. Aggressively kicked out. Like they had security. Yeah. No patience whatsoever. She's, no. She seems like a threat. <laughs> She of seems course. like she would beat up two men and a security guard. So I was thinking of taking off my stiletto, but because it's our first time meeting, yeah. I thought maybe beating the security guard That's, with it. So Canada, a, Canada is a lot more aggressive than I thought. Yeah. Apparently, like I, yeah, the guy didn't have a gun, security guy, but he would have beat me with his. his He's ready to go. His sorries and. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you have some background in writing and filming. Did a documentary about. Um, there was a flood in, in South India, in Sri Lanka. Um, this was 04 that I was working for this uh, Food for Life Global. It's an international uh, vegetarian relief agency. So they go around different uh, disasters and they serve out warm, fresh uh, vegetarian meals, which is awesome because I've been vegetarian my whole life. So I got you know involved with this organization. One day the guy said, hey, there's been this massive uh, tsunami in uh, South Asia. Do you want to go over and film it? You know, and I was, uh, I think I was, it's two, 2004, so I was 15, 16, and um, I said, why not? You know, I kind of took a little time away from school. He paid my entire way, and, and I went over, and I thought this would be an amazing experience to, um, to help out in some way. Uh, you know, with the idea of being the video that I shoot, we would send back to raise money, you know, raise awareness. So... You know, little did I know, you know, by getting there and seeing kind of the whole thing, it was, uh, it was a whole different experience than I thought. What made you decide to even get into that part of it? Uh, I mean, I, I always liked film. I was like movies since I was a kid. I'm always fascinated with what the camera can do. Um, it can tell a story. It can educate people. It can, it can reach a broad audience. So I've always had a camera in my hand. I've always shot stuff. I've always put stuff together. And so I had a little bit of skill, and, and this guy had recognized it. And, um, you know, when I got over there, over there, we put together an amazing kind of promotional video in order to raise funds, which, you know, ended up we raised quite a bit of money. We had a bunch of volunteers come over after that. And, you know, that, that tsunami was, um, it killed, I think it was 350,000 people. It, you know, it wiped the coast of, uh, of Sri Lanka, you know, entirely. So... You know, to be able to kind of help in that way, the little way that I could, um, was, was pretty cool. And you haven't stopped writing. You haven't stopped doing that whole side of things. Uh, I know throughout your career you've kept up blogs and things, but now you've started a YouTube channel. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I kind of just get, you know, I get bored and I start projects and I try to figure out what, uh, what I can do with my extra time and how can I kind of teach what I've been taught and share some of the, uh, the cool stuff. So I've started a YouTube channel, Cognitive Goalkeeping, which um, basically it's, it's very raw right now. Um, we're interviewing professional athletes, you know, not just goalkeepers, but any, any position that deals with uh, mental hurdles, which is 
any position and any person in, in life. So it's really fascinating because you get to hear uh, different stories from different people that uh, I think they wouldn't necessarily share, you know, in, a, in an ESPN inter- interview that are asking about stats. But maybe they're talking about things they've dealt with off the field, um, moments in their career where they really they question themselves, they've questioned their, their job, and, and how do they overcome it, right? What, what steps do they take? Um, and everyone's steps are different, but to be able to share that for people that maybe you're about to go through or are going through the same stuff, that they can try these different techniques. And what I like about it is you do keep it real. It's not, you know, you watch these games, whether it's soccer, hockey, you know, in between periods in hockey, they're doing interviews. You get the same answers over and over. Mm-hmm. With you, it's like a true friendship. Uh, you know, these are guys that you've either played with, you've roomed with, um, and you're, you're showing the viewers a completely different side of them. Um, what made you decide that that was the persona that you wanted to show off? Well, it's funny. I don't even, you know, the last interview I did was George Kittle, NFL player. And I had met him 20 minutes before that, you know. So I think it was just a shared uh, bond of wanting to tell our stories, wanting to talk about information that, um, you know, we believe strongly in, you know. And I think his story is fascinating as well as a lot of the people I interviewed. And I think for me, it's just giving them a platform to be able to talk about stuff and to share stories because I've gone through practically everything professionally that someone could go through. So I can relate and we can discuss it in a very open atmosphere where there's, you know, there's, there's opinions and there's thoughts, but really it's just, you know, let's just share the, the stories that have happened and what we learned from them. Um, and that, in that way, I think I'm able to, um, yeah, connect with some of these different people. Okay, my sock game's on point. Um, <laughs> I collect a whole bunch of different comedic, uh, ironic socks. I think my favorite pair is, uh, it looks like the Beatles walking across Abbey Road, but they all have lemons on their head, and it says John Lemon. Amazing. I think it's hilarious. I love wearing it to big fancy events, pulling them out, you know, having some very serious older guy. What does that say, John Lemon? I say absolutely it does, <laughs> sir. What got you into the funky socks game? Uh... I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just odd in general. I like to, I like to stand out in different ways and and express my. I call it art, you know, because I'm 2018 here. But really, it's just being odd in a way that's acceptable. So, you know, odd socks are very acceptable. Ironic T-shirts, very acceptable. Um, you know, and that's that's how I try to you know express it. But not, I'm not trying to go overboard. So that's why the socks are a subtle way to be weird. That's my theory. I like it. It's the best theory I've heard. Uh, you're not wearing any right now, though. No, I got these shoes that are like, they're like pillows on my yeah. feet. Um, and I wear these like obsessively. And it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's tough. When I'm going to like an event and I'm wearing like weird, because these are weird kind of shoes, um, people are, yeah, they're looking at me funny. But that's okay. Another way I'm to be learning. different. I'm all about comfort and I don't really care what people think of me generally. Um, you know, I like to create my own style which is there's no style, there's no really rhyme or reason to it. And, you know, why not? Amazing. (laughs) Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. So what about, okay, I got a couple questions for you. Sure. You've played soccer? I have. Okay, what else have you played? Uh, I played basketball a long time ago. Okay, Um, obviously. (laughs) Yeah, for height reasons. Um, Soccer was definitely my sport, though. That's that's where I was. What position would you play? Goaltender. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Now... Did you ever, like, take a shot to the face or get kicked in the head? Like, Absolutely, something? yeah. Right. Uh, I will always remember the soccer ball right to the face because it hits you in the nose and your eyes, whether you're in a ton of pain or not, your eyes just start watering. You oh, look like that yeah. big wimp on the field. Of course, and sometimes, like, gra- grass gets in your eyes, yeah. too, and that's, that's why we're actually crying. It is. It's, it's yeah. not pain. We can handle it. We have allergies as well, yeah. so things happen. Sometimes there's dust on the field. But you know what I've experienced with, because I've coached uh, youth, you know, girls' soccer as well. Man, they are mean. They girls can definitely be mean. mean, right? Yeah. For like sure. physically we played a team that uh one of the girls ended up breaking my teammates collarbone nice. they just they get in there yeah I, I like i watch them and i'm like wow like because not only are they mean and they tackle each other hard they're like um they bounce right back up mm-hmm. they're like almost invincible when yeah, it comes. we don't stay down you don't you know you don't fake it and i'm not gonna say men men's soccer fake 
it. But they they can embellish a little bit. Okay. So girls don't care. They want to get up and like revenge tackle and stuff. And that's I wish I could teach that to some of the <laughs> boys. I'm like, hey, stop rolling around, stop complaining, get up and go tackle that guy. Get so him. co-ed, good idea, bad idea. <sighs> I've played it. It's it's a good idea until someone tackles me. Mm-hmm. And then I get really frustrated, you know. Or if someone's not passing, uh, you know, and they're dribbling the whole time, it can get it can get aggressive. So I enjoy it. Uh, I think it's great, but uh, not for me. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. Thank you so much. I really <laughs> yeah, appreciate your time. Of course.